from the rurals of Nkanj to the opulence of the presidency office. In this video, I bring to you a man who comes from nothing to ruling one of the wealthiest nations in Africa. From being fired by Tabumpik to firing Tabumpik, Jola Bill's Corner welcomes you and presents to you Mkonto Wesizwe. A story of how Jacob Zuma rose, fell, rose again, and is currently on a quest to take over South Africa for the third time. This probably is his last dance. Enjoy. Honorable Speaker, I don't know whether members want to play politics. Jacob was born to Klinama Zizuma and Nopegisi Sapesi in the KZN and Ganj. His second name, Gejishegisa, is a shortened version of a Zulu mantra his father created which says, Ngegeng Tulu Mundi Engi Geja Engshegisa. This means, I can't keep quiet when someone pretends to love me with a deceitful smile. You, you, you. Young Jacob was poor, like many South Africans during the struggle. He recalls there were two really old people in his village who used to talk about their experiences. Glued to the floor, barely able to move, Zuma was deeply engrossed in their stories about colonial oppression. Let me tell you about the story of my life. Zuma's father was a policeman who passed away when Zuma was only four years old, whilst his mother, a maid, worked hard to feed Jacob and his siblings. When Zuma's father passed away, his mother and his siblings relocated to her parents' home, Grandma Pumud. He was seven years old at the time and was supposed to start school. However, his grandfather asked him to be his herd boy and that was it. He never went to school. Herding is extremely boring. Back then, there were no dopamine incessant activities such as social media or video games. So, to keep himself occupied, he also hunted birds with the slingshot, a common pastime for boys who grew up in the villages. While white kids went to school to study languages, art, mathematics and history, to practice swimming and recite poetry, Titus, bring your friend hither. the young Zuma on the other hand practiced stick fighting. But Jacob was good at stick fighting and his friends liked him, especially for his strategic tactics. He later returned to his place of birth in Ganja, where he continued to herd cattle. Bored, he decided to teach himself how to read and write. He often bothered other kids who did go to school because he was just curious. What are all these kids doing? He harassed them for their books and would go to Sis Maria, a local lady who did school up to standard 4, that is, grade 7, to ask for help after he'd put the kettle back in the kraal in the evening. In 1953, when Zuma was 10, the Bantu Education Act, a law stipulating that black kids should be educated separately from the white children, was passed. In 1956, when Zuma turned 14, a historic moment began to unfold. The treason trial had just begun. And in 1959, three years into the five-year-long treason trial, at the age of 17, Jacob Zuma joined the African National Congress. My name is Nelson Mandela. I am the first accused. I do not deny that I planned sabotage. I did not plan it in the spirit of recklessness, nor because I have any love for violence. The hard facts are that 50 years of non-violence had brought the African people nothing but more and more repressive legislation and fewer and fewer rights. Africans want a just share in the whole of South Africa. We want equal political rights. One man, one vote. I have dedicated myself to this struggle of the African people. I have fought against white domination. I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the idea of a free democratic society where all persons live together in harmony with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and achieve. But if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. Shortly after the Sharpeville massacre occurred and the police killed 69 unarmed black civilians and injured 180 of them, they shot them at the back as they fled. Come on, man. 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 Come on,
Umkonto Isizwe was founded by Nelson Mandela in the wake of the Sharpeville massacre. Its mission was to fight against the apartheid government by taking up arms. Nelson Mandela had successfully convinced the members of the ANC that diplomacy would not suffice, that it is virtually impossible to fight the apartheid government in speech and oratory, while they, on the other hand, used guns and weapons to rule the country with an iron fist. The ANC didn't want to be associated with the MK for PR purposes but its leadership council agreed that it was necessary to have a military wing. So Nelson Mandela, Oliver Tambo, Joe Slovo, Chris Sani, and others worked together in secrecy to secure arms to wage war against the apartheid government. And so Zuma, talented in stick fighting, naturally gravitated towards the MK. He, alongside his comrades, planned to cross the border into Botswana. From there, they headed to Zambia for military training. But their plans were revealed to the police before they even began. There was a rat. Someone had ratted them out, sold them out, betrayed them. Betrayed me! So the policemen beat them. Mkonto Caesar would plant bombs to blow up electrical stations and use explosives to destroy infrastructure in order to get the government's attention. Zuma went on a series of different shenanigans in efforts to aid Mkonto Isizwe. And as a result, he found himself caught on the right side of the wrong law, where he'd be held beaten or put in solitary confinement for weeks. Zuma was charged with conspiracy to overthrow the National Party. The trial was held in Pretoria Old Synagogue and Zuma, at the age of 21, was sentenced to 10 years. Uh, the MK question. Well, <clears throat> that's, a, uh, that's a complex question. It's not a simple question. On his way to Robben Island, the van would make stops at different police stations to collect other prisoners who were sentenced to Robben Island. Along this treacherous journey, Zuma met his lifelong friend, Ebi Ibrahim. The handcuffed prisoners were also placed in leg cuffs connecting the prisoners together to limit their mobility. They moved in a windowless van with a single bucket to pee and take a dump in. Each prison cell hosted between 30 to 50 other prisoners. They bathed in cold water and ate umbila three times a day, every day. During his 10 years in prison, Zuma never received a single visitor. He advised his mother through a letter that it would be pointless for her to use up a large portion of her very small salary to come and see him, where they'd only be allowed to share 25 minutes together. He explained to his mother that the income should rather be spent on his brothers and sisters. They worked long hours in the stone quarry for the construction of my jail cells. Prisoners would often be stripped naked and asked to bend over backwards such that their rectums would show so that the warders can inspect that they are not smuggling anything into the prison. Many political analysts, however, speculate that the reasons that they were stripped naked was more sinister. It was a perverted act to degrade them as humans and break them psychologically. Despite these hardships, however, they were allowed to enjoy playing soccer together, where Zuma excelled in his position as a defender. He played so good, in fact, that he was the captain of their soccer team, the Rangers. Zuma indulged in as many prison activities as he could. Events organized by the prisoners for the prisoners, like playing chess or organizing traditional dance events. In Robben Island, Zuma would sometimes be one of the youngsters listening attentively to fierce political debates among the Rivonia trialists. He'd watch his heroes keep up a continuing catalogue about their beliefs and ideas and how they argued them, questioned them and refined them. He watched them evolve in their thinking over time. As time went on, the more depth their conversations would have. Zuma learned as much as he could. Zuma didn't realise this at the time, but this was university. He may not have graduated from formal education, but his experiences in Robben Island broadened his horizons and he graduated with an education in real life. Nelson Mandela, Walter Sisulu, and Gavin Beggy were amongst others who were sentenced to Robben Island during this time. They, however, were sentenced to lifetime. Thus, on the 29th of December 1973, Jacob Zuma left them behind to continue the struggle. He was released and taken to his home in Ganj. Now! Come on, come 
bloody farm, you mate! I have six hey, seconds to clear the area. Let's go home now. Free from the confines of prison, Zuma married his childhood sweetheart Sizagele Kumalo, commonly known as Uma Kumalo. In 1975, Zuma left South Africa. He was first based in Swaziland, where he met future South African President Thabo Mbeki, who first taught Zuma how to use a gun. Zuma traveled back and forth between Mozambique and Swaziland, helping South Africa from the outside. However, in March 1976, he, alongside Thabo Mbeki and Albert Joma, were arrested and held at Matapa Prison in Swaziland. Through the intervention of Oliver Tambo, they were able to avoid deportation into South Africa. Rather, they were sent to Mozambique in April 1976. In Mozambique, Zuma quickly climbed the hierarchy, occupying position of Deputy Chief Representative of the ANC, and later the Chief Representative of the ANC in Mozambique. During his time here, Zuma also went to Russia for three months to complete a leadership course in military training from the Soviet Union. Thus, he was still very much involved in ANC's military wing, Mkonto Wesizu. However, his time in Mozambique would soon come to an end as pressure reigned in on Mozambique's government officials from Puerto's regime. So, in the late 80s, Zuma moved to the ANC head office in Lusaka, Zambia, where he was appointed as head of underground structures, a title he truly deserved. Since his release from Robben Island, Zuma worked secretly and moved in silence for more than 10 years. Secrecy was vital for the kind of work he was doing, because real Gs move in silence like lasagna. 11 February 1990 marks a significant moment in South African history. Nelson Mandela was released from prison. Zuma, alongside Sabon Peki, formed part of Oliver Tambo's negotiation team which met with the South African government's representatives. During this time, Zuma was working very hard to strengthen ANC's foothold in KZN. This came at the expense of Inkata Freedom Party, as many IFP supporters switched their allegiance to the ANC. Shortly after, Zuma was elected as Deputy Secretary General of the ANC, further cementing his power and influence within the organization. Negotiations between the ANC and the South African government progressed, and his ascent to power began to unfold. A new age was upon us. Tata Matiba ushered in a time of peace and prosperity for South Africa. Three years after democracy, Zuma was elected as the ANC's deputy president. In just two years, he was subsequently appointed as the deputy president of South Africa, a position he held until he was fired by his longtime friend Tabon Peki for embezzling state resources. In 2005, Zuma's financial advisor Shapir Shaikh was convicted for making corrupt payments to Zuma in connection with the arms deal. Feeling betrayed, Zuma spent the next two years plotting his revenge. But just when you thought things couldn't get worse, in 2006, Fezegil and Tulega Kuzoi accuses Jacob Zuma of rape. She remained anonymous during the trial, adopting the name Kwezi as a pseudonym. She was unmarried and also had no children after aborting one in 1995. Growing up, Kwezi was traumatized by the death of her father in a motor accident and also witnessed her uncles and comrades die while they were in exile in Swaziland. As a child, Kwezi was raped on a number of occasions by men starting when she was only five years old. She performed poorly academically, failed him a check, but somehow got into university where she failed so desperately she got expelled. She then found out that she was HIV positive and life continued going on a downhill spiral. Kwezi met Zuma in Swaziland when she was only a child and her father was one of Zuma's close friends. She was 31 years old when she brought the case against Zuma. The High Court looked into some of her allegations of rape against other men and found them to be false. They discovered a pattern of her consenting to sex and then falsely accusing men that she slept with of raping her. The court failed to prove a case against Zuma and accepted his version that they had consensual sex. When I date a guy yeah. on my uh, dating yeah. ages, when I date a guy, yeah. it wasn't out of love. Mm. It was out of revenge of what happened to me. Mm. I will date you 
Today after two weeks when we sleep together, tomorrow go hubule like Casey a rape. I get happy. Tomorrow go hubule like Casey a rape and mind you will be arrested. I did that to several guys. Anger. Anger. But now what about banditile because of anger. Mm, 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 mm. In the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Dale Carnegie famously wrote, When dealing with people, remember, you are not dealing with creatures of logic, but creatures of emotion. And this certainly was the case because in 2005, Mbeki sent diplomats to ask Zuma to resign. As a sign of courtesy, or sign of respect, he should have went there and asked Zuma himself, in person. There are only few authors who have demonstrated the exquisite ability of writing words that would stand the test of time. This couldn't be more true than in the case of Tacitus when he wrote, Men are more ready to repay an injury than a benefit because gratitude is a burden and revenge is a pleasure. The humiliation and sense of betrayal that Zuma felt when he was fired by his longtime comrade Tabombeki cannot be ignored. He worked tirelessly, strengthening his alliances whilst fighting off rape and corruption charges. The ANC was soon split into two camps, those in favor of Tabombeki and those who pledged allegiance to Mshololozi. As Tabombeki geared up to run for the third term as the ANC president, Jacob Zuma had an unstoppable campaign that kept gaining more and more momentum. Cyril Ramaphosa, Matthews Posa, and others such as Tokyo Sikwale all formed part of a coup that ousted Tabombeki of his duties. The walls were closing in on Tabombeki. Friends had turned into woes, and the National Executive Committee had lost their faith in Mbeki's ability to lead the ANC. It was an early Friday morning when Zuma went to meet his former friend and ally, Tabombeki, at Ortambo International Airport to tell him that the NEC will be approaching him soon with notions asking him to resign. As the nation grasped the moment of uncertainty, a press conference was scheduled. I have no doubt that you are aware of the announcement made yesterday by the National Executive Committee of the ANC with regard to the position of the President of the Republic. Accordingly, I would like to take this opportunity to inform the nation that today I handed a letter to the Speaker of the National Assembly, the Honorable Balegambete, to tender my resignation from the high position of President of the Republic of South Africa. On the 21st of September 2008, Tabum Beki announced his resignation as South African President. Well done, Sholos. Tabum Beki polled 1,505 votes, while Zuma, on the other hand, 2,329. Zuma was elected as President of the ANC, and Tabum Beki was asked to resign by the NEC. Because his term was not up yet, and Zuma still had some cleaning up to do, Mbeki was replaced with a weaker opponent, Khalei Mamutland. Politics is like a chess game, a game of raw power. One needs to carefully plot his moves and consider every possible repercussion resulting from those moves. Zuma worked day and night with his lawyers, finding loopholes and legal ambiguities to get the charges pressed against him thrown out through the window. The National Prosecuting Authority withdrew all 16 charges related to racketeering, corruption, fraud, and tax evasion charged against Jay-Z. With Tabum Beki out of the way, Khalema posing no threat, and his legal battles out of the way, Zuma quickly began making a push to the esteemed union buildings where he would yield his power and influence as the president of South Africa. Jacob Zuma was inaugurated at the Union Buildings in Pretoria on 9 May 2009. His first act as president? Releasing his longtime acquaintance and former financial advisor Shabir Shaikh, who served just over two years of his 15 year jail sentence. Hey, <laughs> corruption had already begun. Again. If you listen to our good friends, the opposition, hey, hey, I'm telling you. <clears throat> You can think you live in another world. You know, some people who could not pronounce Kanja, they've now learned Nkanja, Nkanja, Nkanja. (laughs) Even if you tell them, the Rikanja report is being processed. 
is going to come. I mean, three investigations have been made. Even if we are discussing very serious matters, I mean, stand up, point of order. Yes? Nkanja. Tiggs was a church cock. Hey, the public was outraged. <laughs> In 2012, Tuli investigated the construction of Nkanja, but the state filed a court order preventing her from releasing her 450-page long documents. According to this report, Tuli argued that Zuma must repay stolen state funds. Go look at your payslip right now. While you are busy slaving away working, a portion of your income is deducted in taxes. This theft, <coughs> sorry, I mean taxes, is to build infrastructure, improve education, and ameliorate the suffering of the poor. But instead, every month you earn your salary, you fund the lifestyle of a corrupt South African government politician. Bugala Nantuanangiglaitis. Kashegashe Grand Sharp Neum Sholoz was supposed to improve the security of his homestead. And he deserves this. He's the freaking president of the greatest African country of all time. Maramutu Aibuga Grand Sharp, ne? These security improvements included a big ass swimming pool, a clinic, a cattle kraal, a chicken run, an amphitheater, and other luxuries paid for with our tax money. By the time this project was over, newspaper sources claim roughly 250 million rand was spent on one man. They say men are dogs, but ha, this one, <laughs> the dog of the dog is. Jacob Zuma came out to the podium, his earpiece was ready. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Proud South Africans, proud South Africans, and Indians especially, and Indians <laughs> especially. 939,360,000, no, no, 39 million, 39, 39 million, 60, and 62, no, 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 39, million, 600, Three, three hundred and ninety, no, I said nine hundred, nine hundred million, six, sixty-two thousand, sixty, sixty-two thousand, no, Jacob, you're missing the point, point, hundred million, million, no, Jacob, Jacob, come on, man, listen properly, L listen properly, listen, listen properly, listen properly. We announced that our membership figures stood at 769,800 <coughs> And the Gupta saga begins in 1993 when Ajay, Atul and Rajesh migrated from India to South Africa. They started selling shoes before seeing an opening in the PC business. In 1994, Atul formed Sahara Computers. After a bit of convincing, Rajesh and Ajay joined Atul to get the company off the ground. Back then, Nobody knew that the three brothers would grow up to loot billions of dollars of South Africa's public funds. The empire stretched from selling PCs to media and mining operations. But it wasn't just money that they were after. It was power. So they made connections and placed their chips on various politicians. One of them was a lucky bet. At the time, however, Zuma did not look like a promising bet. Remember, Zuma had the rape case and corruption allegations stacked against him, and Becky even fired him at some point. However, when he went against all odds, cleared his cases, and even way all the way to defeat Becky in the presidential elections, it was the Guptas that stuck with him through thick and thin. In the run-up to the elections, for example, the Guptas would provide Zuma with airplanes and helicopters to take him to various locations throughout South Africa. The Guptas also had several members on their payroll, 
giving jobs to Zuma's children, appointing Tutuzani as the director for some of their companies, and also paying for his wedding and hotel stays. They built such a strong relationship with Zuma that they even started influencing the appointments of serious board positions in companies such as ESCOM, Transnet, and other state-owned entities. They then diverted contracts worth more than $3.5 billion or more than $50 billion in rent to companies owned by, directly or indirectly linked to the Guptas. State capture. Serious, I don't need Zuma to be a president. I, I just want Zuma to fall down, actually. Just that, that guy ne, already is eating our money. He's doing something funny. You know, there's some other people that, 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 that on, on the street. Ne. They don't care about him. We should manage a grand shaft after he back and forth in the ANC. ANC, you see, I'm chigay, lose Zuma, young toll. Pelaband by a complain about the grand shaft. He's out of freaky operator, I'm a coop, diabo. Madam should manage a coop, the shag and peel. Before Bazo Shire, EU 10, Babu Yale move of Fandy one by any diversion, young but tell me the who know the corruption yalla name zanti is due to white monopoly capital esa <laughs> i know he's in jalez manju tina lam zanti says he lwana mapu nu cause vele ang nishus ne history is naks yabo kanti hai papa is this a tea no guti attention ibe diverted he attention is a diverted gananji yabo tina's focus a gui white monopoly capital scores wa inda by a state capture while si logas on, bona bayas, papis, by a collect, or begging mal, benza ma passport, by enzelu guti crenshap mes babamba, it will already be too late. Ay ngem pelas babamba vele yabo. Puma ama file, pumi proof, rena ma email, au hundred and hundred. Ama email in jayaba expose, guti vele crenshap labantu laba baye o nim zans yabo. Mongan kolo, hambo bugeli how to steal a country la paku show manx. I feel him a lint to over, lip lined over, so born with the green shop, lent by operator ganjan yang tol. I recommend and tell good mangi bugel and am gangani abomanganza e research for le video leo bugel, manjing eyes with a nose, ya keep a lap. Eyes are picking up and gina singi bugel, I own kevel. Unja, no one is. Why are you taking this thing? I need to zoom over she or melabam keep. Melabam keep. Well for the bum keeper. Mpela ba mki puzum, and he launched mkonto we siswe. Former South African President Jacob Zuma announced that he would no longer vote for ANC. He'd rather back his newly formed Mkonto Isizwe. He publicly said that voting for the ANC of Ramaphosa would be a betrayal and his conscience just can't allow it. Could it be that this is just a slick move or power trick to oust Ramaphosa so he can sit on the throne of power again? For the first time ever, according to the polls, it is highly likely that the ANC will get below 50% of the national vote this year and may need to form a coalition government to remain in power. ANC is facing some tough competition this year due to opposing parties such as the DA, EFF and other smaller political parties. I think there will be a back and forth. Ramaphosa will resign, Zuma will claim the glory, and this will, air quote, unite ANC supporters with newly garnered MK followers, and the ANC will win majority again with a narrow victory like 50, something percent. I mean, think about it. If the original ANC supporters stay, then Zuma works out some kind of arrangements with the ANC to oust Ramaphosa, provided that he will come back and run the party. What that means is that all of the supporters of ANC and all of these new supporters that Zuma has garnered under Umkonto with Sizwe will come together and this just might give ANC an edge and ANC might just win again. This is just a conspiracy theory. It's a hypothetical. It might happen. It might not. I don't know, but we shall find out in a few months. Zuma has the stoic fearlessness and loyal demeanor of a typical Zulu man. But he frequently also displays high levels of emotional intelligence, a trait his mentee severely lacks in. He may not have finished school, he may not have studied fancy degrees and graduated from fancy universities. He often struggled reading books, however, his true power came from his innate ability to read people, not books, with ease. A talent that launched his ascent 
to the presidency office, a curse that triggered his descent to the prisoner's jail cell, a talent that is currently sending him back to the lofty seat of power all over again. Zuma truly is something we've never seen before.